Hey guys, it's April and welcome back to the Gumbu Garden. This is our January garden tour and last month I had talked about the explosion of growth that we've had in the garden. As you can see behind me, things are actually starting to bloom and we're beginning our harvest now. Let's have a tour around and we'll see exactly what's going on now. We'll start at the back of the garden this month at our tomato bed. So these are all our indeterminate tomatoes. I haven't been in the garden much this past month because it's been quite busy with Christmas and New Year's and all of that. Um, so these tomatoes have just grown as they would grow. I haven't pruned them. I haven't tied them up. This is just how they are. The first thing I'm noticing are the amount of marigolds that have grown in the garden. I think there's also some calendula in here. Yeah, there's our calendula. And along with the marigolds, look at these tomatoes. <gasps> there are tons of tomatoes growing on these vines. So just doing that little bit of a shaking of the plant when the flowers are open really does work because the flowers of the tomato have both the male and female parts in them. You can just tap them and shake them and that will get both parts to kind of blend together and get that nice tomato to form. So I'm really, really happy with the amount of tomatoes that are growing. And hopefully next month, I'll be showing you my ripe tomatoes and we'll begin to start making things with them and canning them. All of these tomatoes here along this end, these are the ox heart tomatoes. So we're gonna have quite a few of these and these guys should get really big. The ox heart tomatoes are the only ones that have fully ripened so far. So I've gotten three tomatoes out of the garden so far this season and it was ox heart tomatoes. The only thing is when I picked them, the top part was yellow, which I haven't ever seen that before. So I'm not sure what that means. You guys had a lot of great advice in the last garden video. So if you have any idea what that means, just let me know. Um, it doesn't seem to be that they didn't ripen because I did leave them out on a windowsill and they actually started to get really soft very quickly. I'm hoping none of the others end up being like that. I hope they end up coming out normal and looking beautiful. We also have some Dr. Witchy tomatoes growing in here. They are a bit smaller, so they won't be ripening up as quickly as the ox hearts. There don't seem to be as many of the Dr. Witchy tomatoes either. This Dr. Witchy's is very, very short. It does have the most tomatoes on it out of all of them, but it hasn't grown tall at all. So I don't know why that one's so short and the others have grown a lot bigger. We also have our cherry tomatoes over here, which there is a cherry tomato that's ready. So we're gonna eat that. This is the Rapunzel cherry tomato. So it's quite small. They are starting to form a longer line, but let's try this one. It tastes like summer. Mmm. That was really nice actually. So I can't wait for more of them to ripen. In this bed were also our peppers. Peppers down at this end are quite small. This one was getting covered up by the marigold, so I need to tie that back a little bit. It is still flowering though. They get a little bit bigger as we move this way. So the peppers are starting to grow a bit bigger and flower. These are the normal green capsicums or green peppers. So we'll be getting some of those starting to grow soon. And then we have our jalapenos. That one's a bit small too, cause it's been shaded out a little bit by the marigolds. Oh, and this one. <laughs> Looks like maybe I need to tie back some of these marigolds so that those peppers are getting a bit more sun and they can grow a bit bigger. So that's one thing that I need to put on my list to do today. Although these chili cherry red peppers down at the end are growing quite big and they've got peppers growing on them already. Yay, look it. Ah. So these guys are definitely further ahead than the rest of the peppers that are growing in this bed, but they're all looking really healthy and they're flowering and starting to put on some peppers. Peppers take a bit longer to fully develop. They grow quite slowly. So 
I'm not expecting to have a harvest of these until the end of summer, but to know that they're flowering and starting to grow and the peppers themselves are getting bigger, the pepper plants, that's really good. So they're staying healthy. I just need to tie back some of those marigolds to make sure that the smaller ones are getting just as much sun as the rest of them. But they're looking good. So where are those tomatoes, by the way? We're going to have heaps of tomatoes just from this bed here. Let's move on to the next bed here, which is the one behind me that had the eggplant and some more tomatoes in it. So these are the eggplants that I was concerned about at the beginning of December, but they're looking a little bit better now. They're not big and bushy, but as you can see, they are starting to flower. So hopefully that means that they are healthy enough and getting enough nutrients and sun and water and whatever they were lacking before that they will put on some eggplants for us. I've also got some other random things growing in here. That's one of our sugar rush peppers, some holy basil, and I've got a little watermelon plant growing behind here. There's also another one growing here. I haven't had the best of luck growing watermelons they tend to not get much bigger than this one that's growing here. Um, I've never had anything pollinate on them. Uh, they just tend to be quite small, so I don't know. <laughs> but this is more of one of those special treats. So if they grow, that's awesome. If they don't, a bit of a tester. Um, I don't really need watermelon. It's just a fun summer snack. So um, we'll just kind of see. There are a couple flowers on here right now. I think they're both males. I don't know how they, I'm assuming there's male and female flowers. I'm not really sure. I don't see any female flowers on there yet. I also had rambling romas growing in here and they have quite a bit of flowers on them. And they're also starting to grow tomatoes. So we've got some tomatoes there. We've got a little bit of pest pressure here. So this, let's see, is there anything on the back of that? But it has been in this bed that I have had loads of caterpillars. So there's a lot of white butterflies flying around. I've been finding like those big green caterpillars on my plants in this bed and just kind of picking them off and tossing them into the bush when I find them. But that looks like something a little bit different that wasn't completely eating the leaves, but that's all right. Um, it's just on like two leaves out of the whole plant. So I'm not overly concerned with that yet. I will pick this set of leaves off of the tomato though, because I don't want whatever's on those leaves to spread to the rest of the plant. So we just get rid of it early and hopefully we don't see it again. At the end of this bed is where we had our gherkins as well. And last month they were about this tall and this month they have grown all the way up to the top and now they're even kind of coming off of the top and leading, let's see, over to my tomato stakes and clasping on. So they are growing very well and we're gonna get in here this time and see if we have any gherkins growing, which I know we do because I've already picked heaps. A, a big one here growing and another one and here and over there there are heaps just in this one plant just kind of in that one area we went away for christmas for like four days and when we came back i checked on my garden and the amount of gherkins that were on this plant was ridiculous and some of them had grown huge like a big cucumber size <laughs> and um, I was able to do four jars of pickles just out of what was there from like four days. It looks like I'm gonna have to get in here and pick some more and possibly do some more pickles. The next time I make pickles I'll make a video of that for you guys. This is also where my queen bush pumpkin is down in this bed and this is the only one at the minute that is still alive. The others did get disease on them. I've tried to spray and doing the spray just really hasn't worked. This one is also fighting off a little bit of disease, but I have been spraying my zucchinis, my, my gherkins, this pumpkin plant with a milk and water mixture each week to just kind of 
keep away the disease or help prevent it from getting worse. And it has worked for this one, but at the minute there is nothing fruiting in here. This obviously was one that didn't get pollinated. Um, we'll take that out of here. Actually, we'll just toss it to the side. <laughs> But there's also not very many flowers on it. Actually, it looks like in here, we've got a couple that are thinking about growing. So pretty soon we should have another chance to get some of those bush pumpkins. So let's keep our fingers crossed. The plants on the end of this bed are looking remarkable. This is my pineapple sage, which has exploded this past month. So I need to harvest some of that. There's my pansies again. This is the dahlia that hadn't bloomed last time you were here, but I mean, look at it now. And this color has changed. Last year, all of my dahlias were this color and they must have mixed this year because they're a completely different shade, which I think they look beautiful in that shade actually. I love how they have the pink there. Uh, it's just weird <laughs> because they're the same tuber I thought so I don't know how they change shade I know that when a dahlia grows from seed it can be anything so it depends on what it's how it's been pollinated um but it can change into any color any shape you never really know what you're going to get but when you have tubers I thought the tubers stay the same but no complaints I actually really like that it has this pink in it they look a little bit messier than the plain yellow ones do. Their leaves are a little bit more curled, but they're beautiful. I love dahlias. This, however, is my favorite, favorite part of my garden this year. I have my two tall sunflowers growing huge. I've got my vining plants in the middle. I've got the beautiful coriander just blooming. This part of the garden just looks so beautiful and in upcoming years, I'm going to do a similar thing because I love that these sunflowers are just here, you know, welcoming everyone in and that underneath the archway is just lush and full. This is a little um, bush raspberry and it has grown some here. So we have some that are coming in, but if you can look closer, See this one here? That one has been eaten off. <laughs> I have eaten zero raspberries this year from that plant because the birds are getting to them right before they fully ripen. So I haven't had a chance to get any this year, which is a little bit disappointing, but that's okay. It's looking so much more lush than it did last year. And I imagine that in the coming years, it's just going to get bigger and bigger and produce more raspberries. And if I don't get any now, I'm sure I'll get some later. To my curry pumpkin, not looking as lush as it was before. All of its leaves are dying. It is diseased. However, look at this beauty. We are getting a pumpkin from it. So this is beautiful. So this is the red curry pumpkin or Henry's Potamaran. Just letting that fully develop. When this tendril here and the stem just kind of dry off and die, then we'll know that it's ready to be harvested. So I have a bit of time. The tendrils are, the tendril is starting to die off, but I have a little bit of time before it's ready to be harvested, but it's just beautiful growing in the garden anyways. So that's okay. It gives a nice bright touch. There's also another one on this side that's growing and this plant is doing much better than the other one. We obviously have a couple leaves that I need to take off here, um, but there's another vine. This one's vining over on this side too and coming down has a flower on it. That's a male flower in there. With this plant doing so much better and not dying off yet from disease, there's a chance we'll get multiple pumpkins from this vine. So hopefully keep your fingers crossed that we can get more of a harvest from this because the pumpkins are beautiful. I haven't tasted them before, but they look beautiful. <laughs> I'm sure they taste just as beautiful as they look, but we'll find out later in the summer. These squash vines are also doing something really cool as well. If you let them trail on the ground or dirt, 
they will start to grow roots along their vines. And when they do this, that will help produce or give more nutrients to the fruit that they're producing. If we have a look in at these plants, I can show you what it looks like on the butternut squash. This is actually a perfect example of one that's just starting to form. Off of this node here, we have our leaf, we have our tendril, we have what could potentially be, I don't know, a fruit, but there's also this little guy here. This is actually a root that's starting to form. It's starting to reach out into the ground. So I'm just gonna kind of set that back in there. And the vine has the potential to do that along each one of its nodes, just set out those roots and allow more nutrients to be gathered up into the plant for your squash that's growing or pumpkins or you know any type of vining plant that you might have. My butternut squash vine is doing heaps better than the others. I mean, look at the amount of vines and leaves coming off of that. It has put off a lot of flowers and has been pollinated. So we definitely will be getting this one. It's still very small, but I have high hopes for this plant and I think it's going to produce quite a number of butternut squash for us. So stay tuned with that one. That's really exciting. This is my first year growing squash in vining plants because I didn't think I had space in my garden other years and turns out I do. So I know they're getting big. I know they're covering the walkways, but they just look beautiful. I mean, okay, not that one. <laughs> but, but I love how they're flowing off of my beds and into the into the grow, the walking space. It's just so nice. Um, I will definitely grow vines again next year and upcoming years because it just adds a whole nother element to the garden. And you know, it's something, like I said, I thought I couldn't do it and I can, there is space. Um, it's just, I personally love a nice thickly planted garden space. I don't necessarily like things neat and tidy with, you know, looking all perfect. I love this like wild look that I have going on this year. It's so nice. Um, the other thing I want to do is there's a space out here. So that big space. And if you've watched my videos before, you'll know that I have talked about this a few times. <laughs> that big space there, I want to turn into a big pumpkin patch or squash patch. Um, right now it's full of other vines um, that are just kind of overtaking. So there's nasturtium in there. There's this other like green vine that just puts down roots at every node. Um, we're starting to get that other like white flowering vine in there. Uh, I think one of you told me that it was a form of morning glory. I did look it up and yeah, it it is. <laughs> which um, is a bit unfortunate, but um, yeah. So there's a few different vines growing in that space that are going to take some work to clear out, but I'm gonna say it again. I said it about this year that I wanted to have that as a pumpkin patch. I'm gonna say it for next year now. I want that as a pumpkin patch in my garden. So it's gonna take a bit of work, but I'm here this winter, la this past winter, I went back home to the States um, and didn't get a chance to really do much winter work. But this year I will be here for winter and that's one of my tasks that's on the list. We've also got our crown pumpkin here, which has a lot of flowers. It's been putting off a lot of flowers. Unfortunately, most of them have been males, which all of these are as well. I did have one female flower bloom. I tried to hand pollinate it. This is still green at the minute. So hopefully that means that it was pollinated and we'll get at least one crown pumpkin from there. And then we have my bee balm or bergamot that has started to flower. So that really attracts the bees. I love that. I have that one growing there that was self-seeded, but also here in this pot. It doesn't do fantastic in pots, but it will spread like wildfire if I were to put it in the ground, a bit like mint does. Um, my mother had red bee balm when I was growing up 
and she just got a little clump from my aunt, put it at the entrance of the house, and this little clump turned into massive, massive area that had bee balm, which looked beautiful and attracted so many hummingbirds, which is so nice, but I just don't have the space right now to put it where I want it to spread. Um, so I just keep it in a in a container at the end of my garden bed so that the few that do come up and bloom helps attract some of the bees near my vegetables. My coriander is starting to bloom. It's a bit wild. It's, you know, I had to tie it up because it was falling down to the ground, but we will have our seeds soon. So you can see here that it has the flowers and then these little balls here, they will dry out and be our seeds that we'll be able to keep. Once the seeds dry, I'll grab those and we'll get rid of this coriander. Um, but at the minute, I think it looks beautiful with all its white flowers. And if we go through this jungle of coriander, there are tomatoes back here somewhere. This one I think is the purple cocktail that's growing. A few more back here. These are getting closer to ripening, but not yet. They still have a bit of green on them, but there's our purple cocktail tomatoes that are growing. We do have some Brad's Atomic Grape growing in here too, if I can find them. Oh yeah, these are a little bit easier to find. They're just kind of on the edge of the coriander, but there's our Brad's Atomic Grape. We have heaps of those growing. They're not quite what I expected them to be actually. I thought they were going to be a lot more vibrant with their colors and they're not really. They are just starting off green and turning stripy purple. Um, I have some others on the other side here that are a little bit more ripe and they're just, they. I haven't seen all the colors that I was expecting to see with, according to like the picture and what I've read about them. Maybe it's because they're not quite ripe yet. I think these here were, the most ripe out of all of them and i guess there is a bit of yellow on this top one i'm not sure if you can see the little stripe there um, it also looks like something has been getting at it and that it's a little bit diseased but um i don't know <laughs> not overly impressed with these when they ripen they're meant to be green tomatoes with a purple and yellow and orangey stripes on them so maybe they just haven't fully ripened yet and their beauty comes at the end um when you pick them <laughs> so we'll see when we pick them see what happens um and hopefully they taste good as well there's my cucumber plant it's growing we've got a huge cucumber here that needs picking. So I'll have to pick that later on today when I do my harvesting. I typically come out every morning and just check on everything in the garden, water it if it needs to, and then harvest whatever I can harvest. Everything that I have been harvesting this year, I have also been weighing or keeping record of how much I'm able to pick and also checking to see what it would cost at the grocery store if I had to buy it. It's interesting to see really just the fluctuation in the prices and how much money that I'm actually saving from growing my own vegetables. So I will definitely do a video on that later in the season once, you know, summer's over and I've, you know, checked on how everything, um, how much I was able to grow of everything and just show you exactly what I've been doing with that. But that's just another interesting thing that I've kind of been doing as I've been harvesting this year. My cucumber in this garden bed, okay, we have another one that needs harvesting. I've had so many cucumbers so far this year and gherkins, but this cucumber here, I think is on its last days. It is not doing well. I'm not really sure what's happened to it, but it's dead. <laughs> I'm gonna have to pull that one. So with that dying cucumber, it led us into our next bed here, which is full of tomatoes. Again, tomatoes, marigolds, calendula, and um, that cucumber is the only thing that's dying in this bed. It looks beautiful here. My partner Allie the other day was like, you know, what's what's with that bed? Why is it, what's, why does it look like that? It's too bushy and doesn't look nice. And I'm like, doesn't look nice. It looks absolutely stunning it's 
all the tomatoes are so big and bushy they look beautiful and the marigolds have like grown so tall and <laughs> he's like yeah but it doesn't look very neat I was like I don't want things neat I just want things healthy and producing and that is what is happening in this bed so I want to show you a closer look at all of the Roma tomatoes that are growing here so right from the edge of the bed you can see all of the tomatoes that are growing in there You can actually see the difference in the types of plants here. So the leaves here are a lighter green where this one is a darker green. So one of these, um, I'm not sure which one, I'll have to kind of label them. But one of them is a Sicilian paste and the other is just your basic Roma, I believe. Um, but as you can see, the tomatoes on this plant here are more of a rounded shape where if you look at the other ones, they have a more elongated shape to them. I did plant two different types of aromas this year for a reason. Last year I had planted one type of Roma plant and it was a very, very wet season. So that could have done it, but I planted one type of Roma plant and I had trouble getting them to sprout. And then once I had them planted in the garden, they all were very quick to get disease. So I didn't want that to happen again this year and lose them all because last year I didn't get too many Romas from my plants. They died before they were able to produce heaps. So that's why this year I tried two different types in hopes that, you know, if one died off or got disease, the other one would kind of keep going and keep producing and be a little bit more resistant to whatever disease the other one was getting. But this year it's been much, much better. They look so healthy and so good that you know, both of them are growing really well. So now it's just a matter of which one is producing more fruits for us to have in our garden. I've got this guy here on my marigolds. I think, oh, I can't remember what bug that is, but I'm not sure, is he a garden pest or a friend? I'll leave him for the minute, but <laughs> I'm gonna have to check to see what kind of bug that was again I can't remember um and check to see if he's gonna have any impact on my garden plants or if he's a good guy Each and every plant in this tomato bed is just full of tomatoes. Oh, I see another one of those bugs. So I definitely need to check to see if they are good or bad for the garden. Now that I've taken a closer look with you guys, it actually looks like the rounder tomato is producing a bit more. So I'll definitely have to keep each tomato type separate when I'm keeping track of how much they're producing because I think the one is definitely producing a lot more and a lot better than the other. And that will give me an idea for next year as to which one that I should plant all of rather than planting both of them. I almost forgot to show you the other peppers that we have growing as well. So let's head over to those like 19 peppers that I have in that in-ground space and see if we have anything growing there or at least flowers blooming. So on a whole, it looks like our peppers uh, have grown quite a bit. So they're getting a bit taller. They look like they're going to start really producing. They look really healthy actually. I was concerned that their growth was stunted because it has taken them quite a bit of time to get to this size. But I think if I look back, I think they'll have doubled in size since last month, which is a good sign. Most seem to be flowering and a couple are even putting on some peppers. So this here is the Hungarian wax and we have a pepper on this one and also on this back one here. 
All right, now last month I had mentioned my blueberries were starting to form and I told you that I hoped that some would be ripe the next time that we did a garden tour and they are. So look how exciting. We've still got all of these that are working their way up, but there are some ripe ones in there. We can see through that netting. We need to keep the birds out. There we are. So there's a couple up here that are starting to ripen and I've eaten a few already. But then down here we have a little cluster that's definitely ready for picking. So let's get in there and grab a couple of those and try them out. And they come right off really easily when they're ready and ripe. And they have this film over the top of them. So if you're putting them in the refrigerator, you don't want to wash that off because that's actually help protect them and it will keep them fresh longer. So let's try these out. They're so beautiful. Oh, I'm so proud of my little like handiwork here. I haven't really done much with them. I just want to make sure that I don't overwater them. Um, I started with like a blueberry soil mix at the very start when I planted them a couple years ago. I haven't added much to it except for fertilizer. I have been doing fertilizer in the spring and the fall. This year, because it was starting to produce so much fruit, I fertilized them, I think, in October and November. And um, I probably won't fertilize them again until fall now. But let's give these a try. Oh my god. It's like... Oh, they're so good. This taste, these taste nothing like blueberries from the store. I can't stop. These are so good. They're, oh, they're so sweet. The amount of sugars in here are so good. You need to grow your own blueberries. You need to grow your own blueberries. It's not a question. It's not a suggestion. You need to. <laughs> the difference in the flavor of these blueberries is bigger than any of the other vegetables or any of the other fruits I've grown so far. These are delicious. Mm. Yum. As I rave about my blueberries, I should probably tell you what kind they are. These are blueberry powder blue. These are the only ones that have ripened so far. I do have two different types of blueberries. You typically want to have more than one blueberry plant and you want them to be different varieties and that helps so they will pollinate each other. You'll end up with more blueberries and blueberries that last for a longer growing season because different varieties tend to ripen at different times. So these are obviously ripening sooner than the others. <laughs> I have a little appearance in the background by Kaylin. Um, but these tend to ripen at different times. There are different like main varieties of blueberries that you would want to look to see which type grows better in your climate. Um, but in those varieties, then you can go like different sub varieties. So, and pick what you want. Typically at your garden store, the blueberries there should be blueberries that grow well in your climate. So if you pick them up at the garden store, you should be spot on with what you need to have good producing blueberries for your, your area. Um, the only time you really have to do a bit more research is if you are looking online to buy blueberries, then that's something you might wanna check to make sure you're getting something that grows well around you. All right, let's move over to this last little section of my garden. So this is the in-ground section of my garden. There are all of my zucchinis in the back and my tomatillos. So my tomatillos have really gotten quite large and they are all starting to flower now. I've seen the bees on these quite a bit. So we should end up with a good number of tomatillos. These two at the end, these were actually on my deck until a couple days ago, but even on my deck, we had one. The bee, I saw the bees up there um, and we have one that's starting to go. So tomatillos grow in these little capes and when they're ready to be picked, they'll fill out these capes and kind of be splitting at the bottom here. That's when you know that your tomatillos are fully ready. 
Now, when you're planting tomatillos, you do want to have at least two tomatillos in the same area because it takes two tomatillo plants to, um, to pollinate each other. So that's why I have a group of them here. I have two, four, six, I have eight, a lot. We have eight tomatillo plants just here. And then just on the side section over there, I have three more. So make sure you're planting at least a couple tomatillos together. It's not like a tomato plant where you only need one, you need two at least. Here's our patty pan squash. This is the green one. This has produced a few more than the yellow ones have for us. So that one's ready to be picked there. Got another huge guy in here, so I need to pick him as well. So that one's ready to be picked. And let's see, so this is my the yellow patty pan. So this one, it's a little bit small, but soon that should be ready to be picked as well. The zucchinis are growing quite tall now. Every couple days I come out or once a week, I come out and check to see if they need to be tied up again. And I prune all of these. So all of the old leaves, all of the old flowers, they all get pruned off just until the bottom one that is growing here. And then I leave the rest of the leaves. This one, however, did not get pollinated. So that can probably go. As I mentioned with the gherkins and the bush squash, I have been spraying these with a milk and water mixture to help keep away the powdery mildew. This summer has been way better than last summer. We've had a lot less rain, but there still has been quite a bit of rain and it's been really humid and those are conditions that can bring your powdery mildew on. One part milk to two parts water and I'm just kind of shaking that together and spraying it on the leaves. So I spray it on both the tops of the leaves but also the underside of the leaves because both sides and usually the underside will end up with your powdery mildew. I know that I am prone to this here so technically I should have started spraying them earlier in the summer to help prevent the powdery mildew from coming on and but I'm not that organized. So I did notice that I started to see it. I started to spray it. So I, I take off the leaves that are covered in powdery mildew, the really bad ones. Then I spray the rest of the plant with my mixture. This milk mi mixture will leave the leaves shiny, a nice coat on there, and it will help prevent the spread. So I make sure I do this on a day where it's not going to be raining and I do it in the morning time, gives it time to dry and I mark it down in my calendar so that I know a week from then I have to spray them again. And it really has helped because I think if, if I didn't spray these plants, they would have been covered with powdery mildew and would be dead by now, but they're looking quite healthy. There's still remnants of the powdery mildew here, but you know, we're still getting zucchinis. So I'm just gonna keep it up and see how long we can keep them going. You can see that it didn't necessarily work on these bush squash, although they have some flowers over there, but I don't think they're going to produce. They were already a little bit too far gone before I was able to get to them. And I have that empty space back in the corner. So um, I've pulled the onions that were in the front there. And I've also pulled all of that chard and spinach as per one of your recommendations, because <laughs> like you had said, if I had left them, I'd have spinach and chard everywhere, which I didn't want. So I took your advice, I pulled them all out and I've tossed them into um, a heap at the back of the garden, which if we have a look back there, I had pulled a spinach plant before, like last year, and that spinach plant, even though I pulled it out, it wasn't buried or anything. I just kind of tossed it on top of the pile, has grown back there. That was producing probably almost more spinach than the plants that were up here in the sun. So it did really well in the shade back here, not even buried. <laughs> you can probably see it back there. That one is also seeding and will probably continue to reproduce more and more spinach just in the back of my garden here, which is fine. You know, it's, you know, that's cool. That's cool that it like does that, but it's not going to be in a space that's going to take over any other place where I want to grow other things. Now, lastly, in my main garden, I just want to show you one more thing that I didn't show you last garden tour, and that's my corn. 
So I just have a few. I just have a handful of corn plants that are growing and I believe it's popcorn plants. Last month they were maybe a foot tall, maybe not even. And now they have grown maybe a meter or three feet and they're starting to produce little corn cobs. But we've got little baby corns growing. This one has a couple on it, which is cool. And now the tops up here. So these guys, we need to kind of shake them. And I don't know if you saw the pollen just fall, but the pollen needs to fall down onto our little baby corns. And that's what produces all of the kernels. It's a bit of a tough process for this corn. Um, I'm not sure how well they'll do because I only have a small amount of them, but typically if you have a larger amount of corn and it's in kind of a big clump, you can kind of knock the top bits of the corn and they'll all come down and pollinate the strands on the baby corn, which produce the kernels. Uh, here, we don't have too many, so I'm not sure how fully formed the corn will be, but you know, we can just give them a bit of a shake and hopefully they'll come down and pollinate. Let's take a walk over into the vineyard garden though and we'll see what we've got going on in there. So I was out there yesterday and picked quite a few strawberries actually and we'll see if there's any more ripe today and see what the flowers are looking like that are over here. So the strawberries have continued to produce heaps over here. I have two huge freezer bags full of strawberries frozen in my in my fridge right now. Um, and that's just the excess. I've been putting heaps of them in the fridge for the kids to eat as well. The kids just love eating strawberries. That's why I grow so much actually, because they love to take them in the lunches, they eat them fresh in the mornings and the afternoons, whenever they can get their hands on them. I can barely get them into the house <laughs> before they want to just eat them all. So we have had an overabundance of strawberries this year, which is perfect because they've been able, able to eat as much as they want, but also I'm able to save enough to make some for jams and some other little treats that I might make throughout the winter. And they can be frozen and just pulled out when needed and they stay perfectly fine. And the strawberries back here have been absolutely huge. Now this is just your normal size strawberry, but we've had some that have been double the size of this growing in here. There's a larger one here, but still even this one doesn't even compare to the size that we've seen them. I did happen to see one of the local strawberry farms has said that they have also been getting massive amounts of strawberries this year and they're selling them very very cheap it's just a great season it's been a great growing season for these strawberries a nice mix of sun and rain um, that I think it's just been a good year but I'm still going to in future years make sure I fertilize a little bit more not too much but maybe you know during the springtime once every month to make sure that they get as many nutrients as they can and I think it really did help so um, usually I had just in previous years I had just fertilized them once in the spring once in the fall again but as I'm learning a little bit more on how to supply enough nutrients to the plants I've noticed that you, you know you want to give them nutrients in the spring when they're starting to regrow, but then also when they start to produce their fruits, you want to give them another boost um, to make sure that they're producing big and sweet and good fruits for you. So I've been doing the same thing, the blueberries, the strawberries, um, and all of my like citrusy fruit plants that I have, I've been fertilizing the same way. And my flowers back here are still looking gorgeous. There aren't very many but next year we'll plant heaps more. I mean, oh, they're so pretty. One thing I didn't realize about zinnias until this year, uh, the zinnias are quite large, but initially I was just getting zinnias about this size, which is very small. And I was thinking, oh man, like I thought I ordered the giant ones, the big ones, which I did. Um, it's just that as zinnias grow, they start off small like this guy here and then they continue, their center bit continues to grow and they continue putting off more and more petals until they get to a nice 
big size. If we look at a bigger one, you can see that as it grows larger, this center bit gets taller and taller and taller and keeps putting off more and more leaves to make it a bigger flower. And then see how it's keep producing those little flowers up here until it gets to be this big, thick flower that we have here. This one has been growing for quite a bit and it's huge. Coming away from the strawberries and the flowers back here, I wanted to chat with you a little bit about the grapes. They're doing really well this year and we have heaps of grapes growing. So there are no complaints in that area. We have a lot of grapes that are growing. I'm gonna to have to cover them with some tools soon just so that the birds don't get to them. However, I had shown you that I had put down some mulch over some of the grapes. It has made it so much easier to weed around them. But one thing I've noticed is that the leaves are a slightly different color than the ones that don't have the mulch around them. These here are obviously by the mulch and you can see that they have, you know, a lighter green color to them. But if we head down here to the ones that don't have the mulch, their leaves are definitely a bit darker green. I've also noticed that the grapes that have the mulch around them don't actually have very many grapes growing on them where on either side of them where there isn't any mulch there are a lot more grapes growing on those vines and now if it was on one side i would say okay well those guys are getting a bit more sun maybe they need more sun to grow more grapes but up on the other side they definitely get less sun up there but they have heaps of grapes so my question for you guys is that what have I done? <laughs> um, putting down the mulch, has that, how has that affected my grapes? Um, is it because that they're holding in too much moisture? Because this ground back here tends to be a bit wet anyways and, and mucky. So is it holding too much moisture having the mulch down? Um, is the mulch leaching the nitrogen out of the soil and preventing them from fruiting and being as plentiful as the others or is it some other reason um you guys were so helpful in last month's garden video with a lot of different tips for me i am hoping that you can help me with this here and you know should i take the mulch away should i just you know move it away from the plants a bit more um i mean it's so helpful as far as keeping the weeds down so and I wanted to do the whole vineyard part like that but is that a bad idea I really really need your guys help with this so hopefully you can help me out um and just you know give me some advice but that's going to be it for this month's garden tour. I hope you guys really enjoyed it and keep coming back for more. I enjoy having you here and giving me more tips and pointers and I'll try to do the same for you guys and then we can kind of grow and work together as a team to get our gardens to be as beautiful as they can be. I will catch you in the next one guys. See ya.